us at the moment. You'll be hearing from us on email. Okay, cover to diet, uh, with whom we had a really uh, lovely uh, brown bag seminar this afternoon, is a scholar of literature, post-colonial studies, feminism, and visual studies. She's director of the Women's Gender and Women, Gender, and Sexuality Studies program and associate professor of English at George Washington University. She's the author of two monographs, Violent Belongings, Partition, Gender, and National Culture in Postcolonial India, and the forthcoming Graphic Migrations, Precarity and Gender in South Asia and the Diaspora. She's editor of the essay collection, Graphic Narratives of South Asia and South Asian America, Aesthetics and Politics. Her articles have appeared in several edited volumes and journals, including the Oxford History of the Novel in English, Asian American Literatures in Transition, PMLA, South Asian History and Culture, and the Journal of Postcolonial Writing. Her scholarship dwells on violence and migration in literature and film and other media as well, in its sustained commitment to how gender and sexuality shape the narratives of ethnicity, migration, and rights, her scholarship also contributes to debates in gender and sexuality studies. Her talk today, Graphic Migrations, Hannah Arendt, Statelessness, and South Asia Across Media, is drawn from her forthcoming book. It's my pleasure to introduce Kavi today. Thank you, Richard, for um, that kind introduction. I want to thank you all for being here. Uh, it's almost impossible for us to get an audience for an event at GW on a Friday afternoon. So uh, thank you for, uh, for being here. Uh, before I begin and give my talk today, uh, I would like to thank the Center for 21st Century Studies, and especially uh, Richard Grusin, Maureen Ryan, and Kyle Minor uh, for inviting me and for putting together all the moving parts that made it possible for me to be here today. It is a great honor and privilege, and I have to say I am uh, uh, very much envious of the interdisciplinary community you've created here through this center and the incredible views the center has. <laughs> Um, my talk today is entitled Graphic Migrations, Hannah Arendt's Statelessness and South Asia Across Media. This talk is based on my forthcoming book, Graphic Migrations, and the book analyzes the current crisis of secularism, statelessness, and citizenship through post-47 public culture in South Asia. The book and my talk will dwell in large part on the migration stories generated by the mid 20th century decolonization and partition of India. Especially since 1980, artistic creations, interdisciplinary scholarship, and digital humanities projects in South Asia as well as South Asian America have importantly memorialized the 1947 partition of India. Extending this ongoing labor, my research has turned to migration stories from the mid-20th century as they appear across media to consider their resonance for contemporary South Asia. In the wake of World War II, when the British decolonized and partitioned India in August 1947, as many of you likely know, large-scale violence and mass migration saturated the process. This partition, announced too late and implemented too poorly, led to ethnic violence between Hindus, Muslims, and Sikhs. By unofficial counts, approximately two million were killed in ethnic violence, and as a result, the world saw its largest mass mass migration in under nine months. Between 12 and 14 million people, by unofficial counts, migrated across the new borders depending on their religion. In this conflict zone, as is typical in political conflict, gender-based and sexual violence intensified the trauma of both migrants and citizens in South Asia. 
Now, I should explain the origins of this project a little bit. In the field of post-colonial studies, the focus on the study of nations and nationalisms has meant that for a very long time, citizenship is implicitly or explicitly assumed. Wittingly or unwittingly, these analyses of nationalism revolve around and presume the national citizen subject as the locus of community. When they've considered migration, they often focus on the British or immigrant experience of people from the global south. Out of view until recently has been the historical experience of millions of migrants whose, trans whose transnational displacement constitutes the borders and boundaries of post-47 Asia and Asian America. Drawing upon critical refugee studies and Asian American feminisms, graphic migration centers around this question. What about the refugee, the person in transit to becoming citizen, but not quite there yet? What do we know about the cultural address of millions of partition refugees? How would our analyses of nationalism need to change if we view the nation and nationalism through the peripheral perspective of the migrant. Two decades ago, subaltern study scholars like Ranajit Guha called for renewed attention to the figure of the peasant as an agent of national history. I am arguing for urgent attention to the neglected figure of the migrant as an agent of national history at once a quintessential product of the mid-20th century and as an agent who marks the limits of modern nationality, throwing into crisis its biopolitical discourses of normative citizenship. In this, I am indebted to Hannah Arendt, whose work on national modernity and statelessness anchors my analysis of migration stories across media. I stand at a moment where I wish it was not the case that this second book is so timely, an unfortunate position to be in as a scholar for sure. Even as I was completing the final manuscript revisions and writing this talk, a humanitarian and ethno-nationalist crisis has intensified in Kashmir and in India. Secular protests mobilized against the Citizenship Amendment Act have ended in ethnic violence in Delhi and elsewhere. Hashtags like boycott Muslims are trending in India. Communications blackouts and unlawful detentions in Kashmir continue. And at least two million people, a majority of whom are Muslim and indigenous, have been stripped of citizenship in the northeastern state of Assam. For the first time in its existence, India is building detention camps. My book addresses this current crisis of secularism in India and South Asian America, in part generated by decolonization and its legacies of transnational displacement and war since the mid-20th century. I do so because, as Paul Gilroy has also urged, quote, we need to consider how a deliberate engagement with the 20th century's histories of suffering might furnish resources for the peaceful accommodation of otherness in relation to fundamental commonality, unquote. I draw upon Hannah Arendt's seminal theorization here. Perhaps no one else captures the intimate dispossessions of modern statelessness and border making as well as Arendt. As early as the mid 20th century, rooted in her own experience of exile as a German Jew fleeing the Nazis, Hannah Arendt has distilled the unique situation of minorities who became refugees in the mid 20th century with the rise of the modern system of nation states. In part two of The Origins of Totalitarianism, Arendt lays out her analysis of the constitutive links between the Holocaust and the over 200 years of European colonization of the world that preceded it. Her analysis of the 20th century is resonant, even prophetic, for our time.
She shows how the strengthening of the European system of nation states and the increasing control of their political borders in the late 19th century results in the restricted movements of people such that the condition of Europe's minorities, unless they were protected by special rights and protection from the state, would grow increasingly precarious. As if predicting the future, Arendt wrote, quote, much more stubborn in fact and much more far-reaching in consequence than the problem of minorities has been statelessness, the newest mass phenomenon in contemporary history and the existence of an ever-growing new people comprised of stateless persons, the most symptomatic group in contemporary politics." Unquote. In these writings, Arendt notes that once minorities lose the protection of the state and become stateless, this loss of nationality also leads to the loss of all rights. Although human rights have been regarded as unalienable, one becomes rightless when one becomes stateless. Thus, she points out, quote, the internment camp Prior to the Second World War, the exception rather than the rule for the stateless has become the routine solution for the problem of domicile of the displaced persons." Unquote. Arendt challenges two dimensions that are relevant for the project of 21st century studies, the treatment of stateless people and the post-World War II languages of governmentality. Arendt illuminates the radical modernity of this political condition in the 20th century. What is unprecedented is not the loss of a home, but the impossibility of finding a new one. Suddenly, there was no place on earth where migrants could go without the severest restrictions, no country where they would be assimilated, no territory where they could found a new community of their own. This, moreover, had next to nothing to do with any material problem of overpopulation. It was a problem not of space, but of political organization." Unquote. One of Arendt's most brilliant insights in the origins of totalitarianism for me is this insistence that what has been unique about 20th century modernity above all else has been the invention of statelessness and the fact that this is a problem not of space but of political organization. To engage this critique of statelessness with the aesthetics and politics of transmediatic South Asian migration stories, I want to share with you three media works that engage statelessness in different ways. The first medium I want to uh, talk about are comics. In 2013, Vishwajyoti Ghosh created an edited graphic narrative anthology, This Side, That Side, Restoring Partition. This Side, That Side, for those of you who are not familiar with it, is a groundbreaking work. It is the first collection of graphic representations of the multiple partitions that have fragmented South Asia since 1947, including not only 1947, but also the 1971 War of Bangladesh um, and other moments of uh, geopolitical conflict. The volume in that sense offers a profoundly unique cross-border artistic exploration of partition and its legacies in experimental narratives that are produced by transnational collaboration. So Ghosh in this anthology gathered over 40 writers and artists from three different countries, India, Pakistan, and Bangladesh, and he um, often tried to pair different writers and illustrators together from these different countries. Um, commissioned them to create 28 narratives of partition that are now included in this collection. So as a partition scholar, when this anthology arrived, I had to educate myself about graphic narratives. <laughs> so I had some learning to do. This side, that side, illuminates what is created and what remains after decolonization. Its contributors notably include many women writers, activists, illustrators, and photographers from Pakistan, Bangladesh, and India, like Bina Sarwar, Bani Abdi, Mehreen Murtaza, Sayeda Farhana, and Priya Sen, among others. 
Its narratives vary aesthetically. If some follow a very conventional comics format, others are experimenting with those conventions, as well as the iconography of pre-modern Mughal art, indigenous art forms, and photojournalism, as they comment on media, memory, gender, and migration. And this is a, a, a picture of Koch and his first novel, Delhi Calm, which was a political critique of the emergency. Um, although it represents refugee experiences from 47, the anthology for me is interesting because it also links 1947 with subsequent geopolitical conflict in the region. It talks about the 1971 war, India-Pakistan hostilities, Kashmir, and it dwells um, considerably on the multi-generational poverty of millions of refugees in Dhaka's Geneva camp still living there in um, dispossession. When this edited collection was released, in an interview he gave, Koch said, quote, partition is still happening, unquote. This sense of division and displacement as something that remains as an ongoing condition, psychic and sociopolitical in South Asia, links the diverse border crossing narratives in this volume. Resonant with the project then of tracking the remains of the mid 20th century's histories of suffering, this anthology dwells on statelessness as that which is created and that which remains after 1947. It enacts what Kathy Schland Viles has described as memory work, as the quote, renegotiation of history through survivor memory, unquote. Most of the narratives focus on the perspectives and memories of partitioned refugees, of their grandchildren contemplating their inheritance of loss, and later in the anthology of the refugees and descendants of the Bangladesh War in 1971, um, on to working class teachers, housewives, and poor students currently still living in a refugee colony called Geneva Camp in Dhaka. I want to talk briefly about Ghosh's own autobiographical contribution in this uh, collection, and it's called A Good Education. A Good Education depicts Vishwajyoti Ghosh's own childhood learning about refugee experience as he watches his grandmother, Amiya Sen, work as a rehabilitation officer. The narrative reveals Sen's compassion and her deep ambivalence about her own work as she recognizes her complicity with, states, with the state's violence. So her assignment in this time is to separate the refugee children from their Bengali mothers in order to place them in orphanages in Delhi with the promise of education and a good life. In a two-page panel, this one, which has no frame, Ghosh radically draws the nation's map as one made up of a multitude of refugees. The word and image combine to depict refugees' bodies as constitutive of the nation in the image and in the text as subject to violent governance, poverty, and the failures of the post-colonial state. Other pieces in this collection offer a feminist critique of contemporary statelessness and citizenship in an eco-critical frame. So for example, Malini Gupta and Dyuti Mittal's The Taboo, Sayeda Farhana and Nitesh Mohanty's Little Women, and Mariah, uh, Maria M. Litva's Welcome to Geneva Camp are stories about multi-generational female refugees, about the experience of women losing family members to migration, finding work, losing land, and stuck in the limbo of perpetual statelessness. I want to talk about one more um, uh, narrative here. It's called Karachi Delhi Katha, and it's by Sonia Fatah and Archana Srinivasan, and it's actually set in the post-liberalization moment around 2006. It features a female refugee from Bangladesh, Sayeda, who is living in New Delhi in India. Sayadat actually changes her name to the more Hindu-sounding name, Vimla, to avoid discrimination and find work. She ends up being hired as domestic help by a Muslim upper-class housewife, Sonia, to whom she then discloses her Muslim identity. As the narrative traces their interactions, an unlikely intimacy seems to grow between them. 
However, it's really interesting that in the visual depiction of the characters in this narrative, Saida's face is the only face that is given no detail. In fact, it is curiously pixelated, unlike the other protagonists, whose clearly defined faces and expressions convey anxiety, worry, and so on. Halfway through the narrative, in one panel, Saida finally announces that she has a ration card, that much coveted state-issued ID, state ID card marking one's legal status. Now, the ration card materializes her faciality, and from this panel on, her face is no longer pixelated. The narrative thus marks Saida's dehumanization in the state before documentation, even as it depicts the melancholic refugee as a canny survivor of these institutions and discriminatory milieus. In many stories, the feminist graphic critique of statelessness has an eco-critical imprint, enacting what Richard Grusin has called Anthropocene feminism. If land is at the heart of partition, then trees, roots, rivers, and rivers, flowers, and especially birds, doves, crows, pigeons, sparrows, often populate the frames in which gendered bodies feel trapped or free. In the illustrations of many narratives, people become birds, trees, and rivers. Like memory, they transgress and defy the walled states built by partition. Writing about African-American literature, my colleague Jennifer James has identified a form of eco-melancholia in some narratives. Eco-melancholia, James says, quote, responds to the cumulative losses of nature, land, resources, and to traumas tied to those losses, such as death, deracination, and dispossession. It is activated by ongoing and interrelated social and political violence, including the catastrophe of war, genocide, and poverty." Unquote. So um, let me move along. Um, I think her critique of eco-melancholia is particularly resonant uh, for reading many of the narratives in, in this anthology. And let me just say that I hope you'll all go out and buy this anthology and teach it and read it. Um, the work, to appropriate Hilary Schutz's words, quote, is about the ethical, visual, and verbal practice of not forgetting and the confluence, the political confluence of the everyday and the historical, unquote. This side, that side, instigates us to look askance at the idea of the nation state, to see the post-colonial nation and geopolitical conflict from the vantage point of its refugees. The second media project I want to share with you briefly is the Digital Humanities Oral History Project, the 1947 Partition Archive. In 2009, Gunita Bhalla, a postdoc at UC Berkeley, launched an effort to memorialize partition in a public and institutional way. In 2011, she founded the 1947 Partition Archive, an online digital humanities archive that collects digital video oral histories of partition witnesses. The granddaughter of Punjabi refugees, Bala created a new method of crowdsourcing oral histories. With support from UC Berkeley, Bala developed a, crowd, uh, developed a process to train Berkeley undergraduates and community volunteers for free to conduct oral history interviews. After this training, they stepped out to record stories of those who witnessed partition. Once they had recorded and submitted a partition story, these volunteers were called citizen historians. This unique method of gathering oral histories is now successfully replicated in India, Pakistan, and in 10 other countries. After their training, these citizen historians fan out and record stories in remote rural areas as well as urban center centers and send in their recordings, which are then stored um, in a globally accessible digital cloud. Today, the archive has testimonies from people in 12 different countries in 22 different languages, including Hebrew, Spanish, Thorwali, English, Urdu, Hindi, Punjabi, Bengali, Marathi, Sindhi, Kashmiri, Pashto, among others. 
Each year, the archive also invites students and young scholars to apply to its popular oral history student internship program, as well as its story scholar program. Both short-term programs also encourage participants to take a public role in the dissemination of these stories in their localities. Funded almost entirely by private donors and supported by different institutions ranging from Bikaneer House in Delhi to the Dawn Newspaper in Pakistan, the Pakistani American Cultural Center in California, California Humanities, and Google for Nonprofits, this once fledgling archive has now established a presence in 12 countries, including the United States. It has gathered over 8,000 oral histories of people from diverse religious backgrounds living in remote and rural areas in South Asia, as well as in global cities like London, New York, LA, Mumbai. The archive emphasizes its orientation as a civic platform to offer a multi-religious, multi-dimensional view of the partition migrations in transnational public spheres. And in that sense, I think it's such an important effort because it's the first substantial, bipartisan, not-for-profit institution for recording and disseminating the oral histories of the South Asian partition migrations from all the countries that were involved and impacted by it. It also organizes conversations about partition with witnesses and scholars and creates traveling multimedia insta installations and exhibits. So I want to suggest that these modes of instigating new conversations that link storytelling, art, and media educate local communities across urban centers in India and Pakistan, but also in countries around other countries around the world. In October 2017, the archive announced a collaboration with Stanford University called the 1947 Partition Archive, Survivors and Their Memories. Under this joint initiative, Stanford University's library has currently made available 4,000 out of the over 8,000 oral histories collected. And for me, this illuminates the potential of storytelling and story gathering through digital humanities as modes of performance and activism that can transform collective understandings of the histories of globalization, of decolonization and nation formation. I want to move now to my third media register, and I call this border crossing advertising. In 2013, Google Inc. decided to contribute to the wider rethinking of the 1947 partition that was ongoing in the academy and in the public sphere. So Google produced and uploaded to its video streaming subsidiary, YouTube, a three and a half minute commercial called Reunion. The commercial dwells on partitions, refugees, intergenerational memory, and traumatic histories, key issues in partition studies. It aims to promote Google's search engine in the Indian and Pakistani markets, which at 2 billion people is a pretty substantial market. So I'll screen it for you, and then I'll just share some comments briefly. ये मैं ये यूसुफ लंगोटिया यार सी मेरा लाहौर में हमारे घर के सामने एक बड़ा बाग था उस बाग का गेट बाबा आजम के जमाने रोज शाम को हमने वहां पतंगे उड़ानी और उसके बाद जाके यूसुफ के दुकान से जजरिया चुरा के खानी नमस्ते मेरी पोती मुंबई वाली
दादा जान दिल्ली से किसी की कॉल है हेलो यूसुफ अंकल कौन जी मैं सुमन बोल रही हूँ दिल्ली से आपके बचपन के दोस्त बलदेव जी की पोती याद है बचपन में आप दोनों जजरिया चुरा के खाते थे बचपन में की तंग गले फिर से कूद फांदे छोटी छोटी मीठी चोरी गांठ ले के बांधे एक पतंग सा उड़ता था परिंदों की तरह परिंदों की तरह परिंदों की तरह एक दौर था मन मन मोर था एक दौर था मन मन मोर था पार्टीशन के वक्त हम रातों रात हिंदुस्तान आ गए यूसुफी बड़ी आ जाती है कागजों की कश्तियों में डूब रहता था झांकती खिड़कियों में उलझा रहता था वो भी क्या दौर था मन पे न जोर था एक दौर था मन मन मोर था एक दौर So there's a lot you can say about it. It's it's uh, critics have called it uh, neoliberal, manipulative, uh, uh, dis dishonest. Uh, definitely fails the Bechdel test. So uh, there's a lot you can say about it. Uh, the reason I turn to it is because unlike uh, many other historical moments of conflict, the 1947 partition until 2017 had never been officially institutionally memorialized by any of the countries involved. Um, thus, the return to accounting for partition to understand what happened, what the experience was like for its migrants, all of these conversations have largely been initiated in the public sphere by scholars, artists, journalists, and activists in Asia as well as abroad. In his theorization of post-9-11 hypermediation and premediation, Richard Grusin illuminates the function of, unquote, uh, quote, unconstrained connectivity so that one can access with no restrictions one's socially networked mediated life at any time or anywhere through any of, any of one's media devices, unquote. Extending this analysis to reunion as a post-47 text, I'm interested in how this commercial activates a hypermediated, affective, political, public project of mourning and making legible partitions losses. Created by Ogilvy and Mather's Indian office, Reunion has gone viral, tallying 15 million views since its release on YouTube. It has been seen not only in India and Pakistan, but around the world. Uh, before being broadcast on Indian TV in November 2013. It's received tens of thousands of positive comments, over 100,000 likes on YouTube and other websites where it's been reposted. So across the world, bloggers, writers, and activists have praised it. Indians and Pakistanis in the subcontinent and diaspora, for sure, but also Nigerians, Ukrainians, South Africans, uh, uh, um, a range of people around the world have commented on it. So for example, um, 
Bina Sarwar is a Pakistani journalist and human rights activist who founded an NGO called Aman Ki Asha, which translates as Hope for Peace, uh, which is an NGO working for peace between India and Pakistan. She also started the Milne Do or Let Us Meet campaign. The campaign advocates for the reduction of visa restrictions between India and Pakistan to facilitate travel and exchange. And about this commercial, Sarwar said, quote, if it doesn't move you, you've got a heart of stone. <laughs> and oh, if it was that easy for Pakistanis and Indians to get visas to visit each other's country is just short of impossible, unquote. Now, I want to share with you a snapshot of the reception, uh, some of the comments I saw. Uh, that, you know, about this commercial. So one comment on Google's Facebook page was, Google brought nations together in three minutes and 32 seconds. The politicians of both countries couldn't do this in 66 years. Pakistani author and publisher Musharraf A. Faruqi has tweeted, Google will go to heaven because of this. <laughs> Similarly, Muna Khan tweeted from Pakistan about how the commercial made her father nostalgic. Quote, I showed the reunion video to my dad, who wants me to Google the names of his school friends in India so he can have his own reunion. Uh-oh. Unquote. <laughs> This transnational reception of the Google commercial suggests to me that this narrative resonates at least in part because this was the story of millions of migrants and refugees across Asia, whether in India or Pakistan, scarred by partition, but also in North and South Korea, divided by war, or for the families and friends divided by the oceanic borders between mainland China and Taiwan after 1949. There's a lot more um, you can say about it, and I, you know, I want to hear what uh, what you think of it. But I will share one thought uh, by foregrounding Baldev's traumatic memory of his migration during partition. Reunion unsettles his identity as an Indian citizen. So I think what's interesting for me about it is that by evoking Malde Baldev's refugee past, it anchors his affective life in a secular friendship with the Muslim Pakistani and instantiates his lineage beyond the nation. And it uses the meta language of cinematic Bollywood melodrama something that's al already familiar to its South Asian publics to situate technology as enabling reconciliation as well as the renewal of secular intimacies across India and Pakistan's borders. In staging the precarious intimacy of cross-ethnic and cross-national friendships, the commercial invites South Asians to question the closed borders between the two countries and imagine alternative futures, shared solidarities. Reunion also reanimates the memory of partition migrations as a past that is very much, as the graphic novelist Vishwajyoti Kosh said, still happening. In contrast, originating in the diaspora from the vantage point of South Asian American immigrant experience, the partition archive I discussed earlier as an institution reframes the partition migrations. It provincializes the frame of the nation for understanding the legacies of decolonization in the mid 20th century. As such, like the comics anthology, this side, that side, I want to suggest, it works to create peace in the future in this region. It is an enactment, a movement on the ground of transnational solidarity. To me, the task for us as critics and scholars is then complex and clear. We must read and teach our stories and poetry about statelessness. They have, as Butler argued, political consequences. They are, quote, critical acts of resistance, insurgent interpretations, incendiary acts that somehow, sorry, that somehow incredibly live through the violence they oppose, unquote. This entails retelling the stories about nations and nationalisms we have been so preoccupied with since the work of Benedict Anderson, 
but through the perspective of those who are stateless. And this might equip us to find a new way to live, a new way to reinvent the politics of the present, both in Asia as well as the United States. Thank you.